Welcome to the Magic of Human Beings, Season 2, Episode 14. I'm Carol Cristina da Silva, I'm your host. And for those of you who don't know, I was in Star Wars, I played Rabbi, handmaiden to Queen Amidala. And uh, I want to say this quote. One of the most vital ways we to start again. One of the most vital ways we sustain ourselves is by building communities of resistance, places where we know we are not alone. And this is bell hooks, and I think it's a fantastic quote because it's what our great guest does. She builds amazing communities. A.K. Johnston. So she's an author. Her books range from contemporary fantasy to fairy tale reimaginings, from hopeful sci fi to quiet epics, and from a small town Ontario to a galaxy far, far away. She has no plans to rein anything in. So I'm very excited to bring Kate in. Hello! Hello. <laughs> Welcome! I just remembered I forgot to clean my camera. Okay, go, go, go for a little clean, camera clean. There we go. A little bit better. Oh, lovely <laughs> to meet you. Likewise. Kate, something so funny happened. Uh, so we said 10 a.m., yeah? <laughs> yeah. But actually, it was for me, for you, it would be 9 a.m. for you. Right. So, but I thought, I, I thought it was 10. And then, and then I'm coming here right. and I'm like, welcome to the magic of human beings. <laughs> and I'm announcing you. And I'm saying, yes, and she wrote these amazing books. And also Star Wars books and da, da, da. And then, uh, where is Kate? Oh. And I was like, does you know, even know how to, how can I call him? And <laughs> was so funny. Oh my goodness. But I think what happened was when we planned this, North America was on summertime, I... but England wasn't yet. So when I looked it up, it was four hours, but then you guys went on summertime yeah. and then it went back to five. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it was so lovely because suddenly I was there alone wondering black day <laughs> about star wars and and there were so many nice comments and someone said then someone said oh but he in canada is 9 14 now and i was like okay <laughs> i hope you can come back good <laughs> <laughs> oops <laughs> oops um thank you and hope to see you in 45 minutes <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so funny, but it was good. I had a warm up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I start by asking, like, about your background. So, where were you born? And um, I was born in a small town in Canada called Seaforth. And um, I was actually born in the city, so like an hour away from that. My oldest brother was born in our small town hospital in the middle of a blizzard in December. And after he was born, the doctor looked at my mother and was like, you're having the rest of your kids in London. We will drive to London. I don't, they, there was almost a C-section and the surgeon couldn't get there because of the blizzard and like all that kind of stuff. So the rest of us were born in the city. Um, but I grew up in this small town. Uh, called Seaforth, and then later an even smaller town called Eggmansville, uh, which had like 500 people in it. And yeah, <laughs> when I say small town, I mean small town. Uh, and and that's kind of where I where I got started. Great. And uh, how did you 
get involved like with Star Wars, like when you're 15, but <laughs> I'm like, aren't you lucky? Yeah, it was the best birthday present ever. Um, so my, my brother, aforementioned Born in a Blizzard, um, was the person who introduced me to Star Wars. He had all of the stuff. Um, and so when I was three, um, that's my first memory of Star Wars. What is your um, age? Um, 10 years. 10 years, okay. Yeah. So uh, when I was three, that's my first memory of Star Wars is having the like, the records playing and hearing all the words and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, I loved, I loved the movies. And, and I remember him telling me, you know, George Lucas has this plan for three before and three after. That's why it's episodes four, five, and six. But we're probably never going to see them. Um, and then on my 15th birthday, we got episode one. <laughs> so it was like a personal gift to me from George Lucas, which was very nice of him. Uh, and, and it's kind of been, you know, a roller coaster that only goes up ever since. Wow. And uh, from being like exposed to this whole world, handmaidens, and from there, what happened? Um, well, as I said, I was 15. So I was like, these, these girls are pretty cool. I love them a lot. And um, we couldn't, like, if we wanted to see the movie again, we had to go to the movie theater, which for us involved a 45 minute drive. And because uh, there wasn't a movie theater in the town. So we had to get someone to drive us to the movie theater if we wanted to see it again. And, you know, there was the internet, but it wasn't as like, big as it is now. So I, I distinctly remember like pouring over magazines at the libraries, like looking, looking at handmaiden faces, like with a magnifying glass being like, do you think this one is this one? Do you think this one is this one? I'm like trying to figure out who the actresses were was almost impossible. Like it was ridiculous. But a lot of the girls in the, in the handmaiden fandom, that's how they got started in like learning how to code because they were building websites on GeoCities. And like learning how to, you know, keep track of, of all these files because they had all these magazines that were their main resources. So it was kind of interesting to sort of watch that come together and to be part of that as people were like building this fandom. Um, and then of course, with the internet, things became significantly easier because we could just look people up. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, looking people, and how did you how did you get into writing um i think like i've always been a storyteller uh -huh. when i was when i was really little so like until uh until we moved to eggmanville we lived um on a two and a half acre property with like a forest in the in the backyard and so i spent most of my like formative childhood in the forest uh you know, doing what I now know is live action role play, but at the time it was just playing. Um, playing either Star Wars or the Chronicles of Narnia, sometimes both at the same time. So I was like making up all these stories and all that kind of stuff. And then when I went to university um, and I had my own engine, my own computer, <laughs> I started writing fan fiction. And that's kind of from that. And then, what, and what was your first book? Uh, my first book that I wrote, <laughs> the first book I wrote is called The Stone Thief. And it's really terrible and it will never get published. <laughs> <laughs> you have to practice first, right? Like, it's bad. Uh, and, but the first book that I got published is called The Story of Owen. The Stone Thief. Yeah. So is that the first rule there? Yeah, yeah. But the first book that I got published was The Story of Owen, uh -huh. uh, which is a story about dragon slayers in southwestern Ontario. And coincidentally, set in the town that I grew up in. Um, because, well, when I started writing it, it was like generic small town. And then it was, you know, everything takes place in the States. Maybe I'll just set it in Canada. And then, and then I was like, you know what? I'm going to set this at my high school. <laughs> so I did. Perfect. Yeah, so it's Dragon Slayers and a uh, musician uh, who kind of writes music about, about the Dragon Slayer. She's his bard. Um, and they're sort of uh, trying to uh, 
get people to take dragon slaying a little bit more seriously. It's become very corporate and they're trying to get it back into small towns. And how, how hard was it to get published? Like how, what was your approach? Did you send it to uh, publish houses? Um... Um, I uh, had some excellent timing. <laughs> um, I was at this point, I was friends uh, with a few authors on through Twitter, uh, through, through the internet. And um, Andrew Carr, an editor that I really respected, had an open call, which meant that you could send him a manuscript if you didn't have an agent. Um, and so I did. And then one of my friends emailed him and was like, you need to read this book. And like four days later, he offered to buy it. And I was like, uh, let me ask my agent. And then I emailed the person I wanted to be my agent. And I was like, hey, I'm pretty sure Andrew Carr is going to buy my book. Do you want to be my agent? Wow. Yeah. Which is not usually how that happens. It does not usually go down that way. Usually you yeah. query agents for a while and then they take you on and then they query editors for you. So I did it kind of backwards and really, really fast. <laughs> but it's your chance. Yeah. 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 It was, it was timing. I had a really great book. I had perfect timing. It was like, and you know, I, I will say that um, I started building my network of authors and like learning how to write and learning how publishing worked in 2008. So it was 2012 when this happened. So it was still four years. It wasn't like I just like stumbled into a publishing deal. Um, but it was, it was a little bit faster, <laughs> a little bit faster than usual. And once you start getting published, blood publishing, did you think about like writing like a Star Wars book? Was already a plan? Oh yes, almost immediately. Um, so this was uh, 2014 and 2015. So we knew that episodes seven, eight, nine were coming, but we didn't really know anything about them. There were rumors about Solo. There were rumors about Kenobi. There's always going to be rumors about Boba Fett, like all that kind of stuff. And um, I wrote a query for a trilogy of handmaiden novels that was called The Queen's Hands. <laughs> um, and I sent it to my agent and he loved it. And at that point, um, I had already sold two more books, A Thousand Nights and Spindle, to Disney Hyperion. And when I sold those books, in the back of my mind, I was like, there's going to be a meeting someday. And they're going to be like, we don't have any YA books, like teen teenage books for Star Wars, we should, we should get on that. And I want someone in that room to know what my name is. Um, it turned out that meeting had already happened. So I was a little bit late, but it was like, I was in the right idea. Um, so because I had a contact at Disney, um, Josh sent, my agent sent the proposal to her. And then she sent it to Mike Siglane, who is the uh, executive director of editing at Lucasfilm. And he called me a couple days later and he was like, okay, so we're putting some movies together. And I was like, you think, <laughs> um, but we're, we'll get back to you. Like you're at the top of our very short list. We'll get back to you. Um, so I just waited basically. And eight months later, they were like, do you want to write a book about Ahsoka? And I was like, I do actually want to write a book about Ahsoka. I was much less calm than that. I was very excited, but that's, that's basically what happened. And then once you've done Ahsoka, did you go like, mm, what about the handmaidens? What about <laughs> pretty much <laughs> what's happening there? I was very not subtle about it because like when you go to conventions and stuff like that, people are always like, Oh, what else do you want to write? And it was always like handmaidens, give me the handmaidens. Um, and oh, then they did. Thing. You kept putting a wish out there into the world. Yeah, just kept putting it out there. And um, they had the original proposal, so they knew that I had ideas. Um and it's, it's kind of interesting how many of those original points made it into the final trilogy, like in different orders and sometimes to different characters. Um, but the sort of kernel of that story has been sitting in my brain since 1999. Um, and I got to, to, to write it all out. Oh, my God. Talking about go and doing the world what you want to see it out there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And it was, it was a lot like that because um, in, in writing, we talk a lot about the three different kinds of goal setting. So there's the, the goals, the goal that you can control. Mm -hmm. 
And then there's your stretch goal, which is like, if everything goes perfectly, this will come together. And then there's your dream goal, which is totally out of your, your control. And the first time I said out loud, I want to write Star Wars books about the handmaidens, it was a total dream goal. Like, I didn't think there was anything I could do. But then your brain starts to, like, turn it over and come up with ideas. And all of a sudden, Disney knew who I was, and I was a respected author, and people knew I could turn a manuscript around in a hurry. And, like, all of a sudden, it was a stretch goal. And I, I love, like, I, I talk to a lot of kids because I, well, when I was doing school visits, I talked to a lot of kids and I'm always like, you know what, sometimes something that sounds completely unreasonable, you say it out loud and your brain is like, okay, we're going to work from here. And, and I, I love that about so many things. Oh, do you know, this is just so beautiful and so inspiring. And uh, Thank you. I hope, yeah, that's things that we should do, have our dream goals and it's exactly what you said. Once you say out loud and you're like, hmm, okay, that's what I want to do. That's what I'm aiming for. And this reminds me of uh, Joseph Campbell's quote about follow your bliss and the universe will open doors where there yeah. are walls. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And the cool thing about being a writer is that like sometimes you can be like, oh, there is no wall or there is no door. I'm just going to like write a door into into the wall here and then open it and go through. <laughs> and uh, once then you start writing the Queen Shadows, the Handmaidens, how was that? Um, it was so much fun. <laughs> I, was, I was a little bit worried. So like with Ahsoka, um, she was a character that I really, really liked, but I met her when I was an adult. Like I was in my 20s, might have been in my 30s. Uh, when I met her, like she was, she was a character. Padme though, like she was one of my role models when I was a kid, right? Like, so when, and like, and also, also Natalie Portman, um, because like, I, I kind of got to watch her, her grow up as I was growing up. And I will always remember going back to the magazines. One of my favorite pictures of her is she's at a costume fitting and she's wearing, I don't even remember what she's wearing. She's wearing like one of her ridiculous Amidala gowns and she's holding a gigantic textbook in one hand and reading it because she's studying because she's at Yale. And I remember thinking like, that is amazing. Like that is so cool. Like not only is Padme and all of the handmaidens, these like well-rounded female characters who have friends who are girls, <laughs> Uh, which was a big thing in 1999. Yeah. Uh, like the, the actresses behind them also have these like, um, at the time I only really knew Kira Knightley and Sofia, Co and Sofia Coppola. Um, and I was like, these girls have dreams. Like that's not, that's not the end of them is like standing in the background. And so getting to write these characters and sort of that I'd grown up with that had been my inspiration. Sometimes it was really weird because like I'd go to write something and I was like, is Padme doing this because I would do this? Would I do this because Padme would do it? Like, it was like this whole circle thing um, of, 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 of cause and effect mm -hmm. and the things that had made me as a person and a writer and, and a girl. And so it was really, um, it was really fascinating to sort of to piece all of that together. So it was it was a very different experience from writing Ahsoka. Um, it was very personal. It was a lot of like a lot. Some of my literally some of my best friends I met because of the Handmaiden groups, um, and like most of my writing critique partners, for example. And um, so the, this this whole like I kind of felt like my whole life was leading me to these books. And it was, it was just so fascinating and so fun to get to piece all those things together. And Queen, Sh Queen Shadows, your first book, I got to know it because I was in a convention and a fan came up to me and uh, as I was signing the autograph, he's like, do you know about the Queen Shadows? And I was like, <laughs> no, what? You don't know? And your character's in there, the handmaidens, there's so much more. He was so excited telling me that. And I was like, okay, let me write it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that was fun. Like people waited, people waited 20 years for a Padme book, which was cool enough. 
but we also got to write the, the handmaidens, the background characters to make them, especially Sabe, because I've been fascinated with Sabe since I was, you know, a teenager, um, to make her this, like, this this character and to make all of them, like, give them all personalities and give them all hopes and dreams and stuff like that. Like, it was it was incredible. And I'm, I'm glad that we were able to kind of be like, oh, you like Padme? Cool. She has 10 friends you're going to love. <laughs> Someone's already saying, so excited about the third book. Can't wait. Well, <laughs> you can have to wait, wait, we're coming to that. <laughs> and uh, so from Queen's Shadows, how, then, how fast was like suddenly Queen's Peril? Uh, the gap between Queen's Shadow and Queen's Peril was actually pretty big for Star Wars. Um, Star Wars happens really fast compared to most publishing. Um, most... Uh, most publishing takes like a couple of years. Like you get the idea, you sell the book, it comes out two years later. Um, Star Wars is like 12 months tops from, hey, do you want to write this book to the book is on the shelf. Uh, Queen's Shadow was a little bit different because of the movie schedule. Um, they had to do some rewriting for The Rise of Skywalker when Carrie Fisher died. So they had to move some stuff around and my book got bumped a whole year. Uh, which is unusual. <laughs> so the the upside was that I got to spend a ton of time with Queen's Shadow. I got to work on it a lot. Um, and it sort of helped me lay the groundwork for Queen's Peril because I knew I wanted Queen's Peril a lot. Uh, so I was very calmly like laying the groundwork of Queen's Peril into Queen's Shadow because I had all this extra time. And uh, Queen's Peril, I knew, was going to be different because of the connection to the movie. Okay. And uh, Terry Brooks, I think it's Terry Brooks, has a hilarious and wonderful um, adaptation of, like, a novelization of the movie from 1999. Um, I, I remember reading it, uh, when it when it was published. Because, again, we couldn't go see the movie. We could read the book, though. Um, so... Uh, I didn't want to just re-novelize the movie. Mm -hmm. um, so what I had decided to do was write kind of like around the movie. So um, it would be scenes we didn't see, scenes from different characters' points of view, um, and then as much before as we possibly could. So about two-thirds of the book happens before the movie starts, and then the movie starts and we start jumping into other characters' points of view. Um, because I wanted to uh, not to, I didn't want to just recontextualize the movie. Yeah. Um, so doesn't do that at all. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of structure, that one required a little bit more thought because I had to decide who was going to go where. Um, but the, so I wrote, I ended up writing that book in 2019, I guess. And the Sashay and Yane parts are from that, proposal that I wrote in 2014. So I've known that part okay. for that long um, because I, I knew that I was uh, gonna, gonna do that with those characters in, in, in the book. So um, it's, as I said, like, this kind of feels like the project I've been working on, you know, my whole life. <laughs> it's, it's like, it feels like suddenly you are in this, I don't know, this thing that is working and it just takes you on and it keeps one thing after the other. It, yeah incredible and yep. how how did you well how did you write how did you research write the handmaidens and i uh, a little bit about your talk with uh, sisters of sabers and i was listening and i was like what wow <laughs> yeah i a lot of queen's shadow and queen's peril is uh don't don't underestimate teenage girls um, and getting to sort of, to talk about that in the, in the context of a Star Wars movie. Um, but in context of research, um, there's a lot of stuff that we and the larger Star Wars community of teenage girls did in the early 2000s um, to sort of make these characters our own. Um, and because we knew that it wasn't going to happen in the movies, right? Like Anakin is going to become the main, we, I always argue that Padme is the protagonist of The Phantom Menace, mm -hmm. but then Anakin is the protagonist of the other two movies. Um, and as he becomes the main characters, the, the handmaidens kind of get pushed back a little bit because the story is, is about Anakin. Um, 
but in fandom and on the internet, you had all these girls who, uh, you know, they would go through these magazines, they would keep all these things together, they would have these files, and, like, I, I didn't have a Star Wars file, I had a Stargate file for the show Stargate SG-1, but it was literally a file folder, and it was full of, like, clippings from magazines and pictures I'd taken out of like newspapers and like lists of episodes and like literally hard copies of all of my research so that I could keep everything straight. And people had that for Star Wars. They had, you know, photocopies of books that they had seen at the library and magazine clippings and like people trying to figure out who the actresses were and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's kind of, so I feel like in a lot of ways the research was done for me. Um, because the, the, the fandom had put all this together in like 2001 and, um, and so kind of getting to reconnect with those girls, like some of these girls I haven't talked to in like 20 years. Um, and I would get to reach out to them and be like, Hey, random question. We were friends on a like internet chat board in like 2004, uh, do you still have that file about such and such? And a lot of them do, like it'll be in their basement or whatever, but, or they've digitized them. Um, but um, a lot of, a lot of those people still have that stuff. And I was able to just reach out to them directly. And then of course, Star Wars um, itself was tremendous. They, uh, they arranged an interview for me with Trisha Bigar, <laughs> which was probably the best hour and 20 minutes of my entire life. Like they somehow cut that down to like 10 minutes for the Star Wars show. And I think the rest of it is just me and Kristen Baver looking at Trisha Bigar like this. Wow. While she talks about embroidery. Like it was amazing. So like the, the resources that I had access to were, were pretty fantastic. Oh, amazing. And when I went to, because first I was cast to, uh, I met Robin at uh, Livestone Studios in North London. And then they called me back for the second time to try outfits. And I just remember being these long warehouses, tables, <laughs> velvet materials. And I was just like, wow, this amazing world. And then putting the dress and then coming and Robin was there then with George Lucas saying, oh, how does this look? Does it work? And da, da, da. So this is the second time I went for the, I went first casting and then the second was with the outfit. And I was just like, oh, maybe I want to spend more time here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, the, cost, the costumes are outstanding. Like, um, just amazing. And there's so much, there's so much a part of the characters um, that that was definitely my favorite part of writing was taking the costumes and taking all of the art and all that kind of stuff and making it, uh, making it work in the book. Ah, oh. and uh, I was reading out loud some of, uh, of some things about Rabbit to my partner, yeah? And he was like, oh, yeah, did she research you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did find out who you were. <laughs> culture, she likes culture, creativity, adapt adaptability. Although sometimes he says I'm not that adaptable. <laughs> With, with some things I was like, no, let's not do that. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but he was like, oh, so it's, I was like amazed, like reading all, and I like how they all have their own chapter when Panaka meets them. Yes, that was my favorite part. Yeah, that was my favorite part. <laughs> and I love that on the top, there is in another language, it's like, for example, cunning, and then yeah. I love that. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, it was very, the assemblage of the, the original Five Handmaidens, I wanted to make it, um, like, Panaka thought he was doing something incredibly practical. Um, and then the girls took it and were just like, next level shenanigans. Like, we're going to take this and we're going to take advantage of it. And they just kind of take off from there. And that was, I loved, I loved writing that. And those, those chapters, um, I'm a, when I write, I am, I spend a lot of time on the structure of the book, of what the book is going to, to look like. Um, and so getting to sort of plot down each of them as like who they were to, who they were to the reader was, was really neat. 
Um, and uh, at the time, I, I always had a soft spot for, for Sabe and Sashe. But as I was going through, I was like, Robbie is so much fun. <laughs> so when you said you were reading Queen's Shadow, I was like, I hope she also reads Queen's Peril because I really put a lot into Robbie in that one. <laughs> I love it. When I started reading Queen's Shadows and I was like, oh, looking forward to discovering more about the characters. And you're like, there's a bit more in Queen's Peril. And I said, okay, that will be the next one. And also... It's amazing because I got, uh, okay, so let me say about Star Wars, we, when, they, when it came out, like I had many friends who were older than me that they were super excited about it. But when it came out, then they were disappointed. So it was <laughs> very, so it was very like, oh, really? Oh, okay. So it was very interesting because when we were filming, uh, like the older actors were all asking uh, George Lucas, like, oh, it's a bit childish, this, oh, this is a bit this. Oh, we... And he was just so down to earth, so like cool about it. He said, guys, this is not for the old fans. The old fans, they, they are fans. They have, they have their fix. This one, it's for the young generation. This is for the children. And it was so spot on. And it's like, it's like a visionary. It's visionary, put yeah. all these handmaidens, all these women together that hasn't been done before. And I have to thank you because, so after Star Wars for a while, I, well, lots of things happened. And uh, I got uh, in private life that I had to do other things, go to Brazil. And then my, many years later, my friend, Hugh Quashi, Captain Tanaka, and I loved him in the book, and I can see his faces. And oh, another thing, sorry, I have to go back to what my partner loved was like when I rolled my eyes because I usually do. Whistling <laughs> <laughs> as well, like when they're talking about little things that everyone do, and <laughs> I'm a whistling. So it was like mm, strange. The same way as you talk about Padme, the things that were happening yeah so uh so what oh yeah so Hugh came to me and said and I think he did a few conventions and he said and he called me Christina my second name he said Christina I was in this convention and they were asking to me like if I knew any any anything about Ravi because no one can find her anymore because I wasn't with my agent so they couldn't and if you're interested in doing some conventions and because I wasn't around for quite a few years and then I was like oh yes okay and uh, now through for me all these things I'm rediscovering all the handmaidens through you yes. books and reading it Salvador and he's watching here he sent me a message and said I found you because of Queen Sparrow I read it and you are so cool that I was like, where is she? Can you hear me? Sorry, there was a bit of a breakup there. You have the spinny thing on, on your screen. Yes. Whoops, I can sort of sort of hear you, but not oh. really. Oh. <laughs> How about now? Okay. Yeah. So the impact so the handmaidens had a massive impact when they came out. 
mm-hmm. in so many people and so many and young girls growing up and now with your books as well it it creates a even be a community it's like so much excitement and and very empowering it's beautiful i was like wow listening these stories they dress up and are also because of academy some political science women being like yes yes so talk yeah I'd for sure i'd love to listen to you about it what do you witness through that um i meet a lot of um a lot of cosplayers uh the the p- the fans who make the costumes for themselves and they do it they're incredibly creative they do it with like incredible like ingenuity and engineering and art and all that kind of stuff and we always joke that uh when you used to do the padme the red padme dress the 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 big one um you used to have to carry a car battery with you to power the little lights um but now you can buy LEDs so it's much lighter um and and easier and easier to do so that that's what i'm talking about in terms of like the ingenuity that these that these people put into it and um so many of them they're a lot of them are quite young they're in college they're just sort of setting out um and a lot of them have a small business they run a small business based on their art either their art or their sewing or their manufacturing um and those are those are probably the people i talk to the most are the girls who um you know they're they might have like a, a a normal job or whatever but they also have this like thing they do for fun that they've turned out how to like they've used it to connect to people they've used it to further a career they use it to make a little bit of extra money and i think that's so cool that um they 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 found a way to take something they love like star wars and uh and to sort of make it part of their professional life even if it's not direct like they're not working for lucasfilm or whatever they still have like that that aspect of their lives or that skill they learned like um you know like i uh, like i learned to a lot of my public speaking actually abilities are based on based on star wars speeches and um so it's really interesting to watch and to listen to these fans who you know they learned something because of star wars and and now it's part of their life yeah and uh, listening to some uh, to the fun girl uh, podcast talking about letters letters to padme i was very moved like people going to hospitals dress up as the handmaidens yeah uh i yeah it's incredible and because the handmaiden the handmaiden costume is one of my favorites the orange the orange and yellow um and for celebration a couple years ago a group of like 40 people decided to make the handmaiden costume to make that handmaiden costume uh Jedi Manda one of the another cosplayer was doing the travel sabe the feathers one mm-hmm. um and so everybody was dressing up as handmaidens for a picture with her basically and some of these girls they'd never cut their own fabric they'd never dyed their own fabric they'd never um like worked off a pattern like this before they'd never worked with this particular kind of material and there was a facebook group that they could go to and there were tutorials and like so some of these girls it was their first costume it was the first time they'd ever done anything and they had to dye the fabric themselves you can't buy that fabric you have to make it and um and the supportive community so for like from from people that didn't necessarily know each other right like they live on all over the world because it was celebration and they all came together in chicago and it was the first time they all met in person and um i was there for the photo shoot it was absolutely fantastic and um just you know listening to them talk to each other like oh you figured out how to sew in that hem or oh you figured out how to make the hand thing work or like oh you're dying is fantastic like just listening to the compliments back and forth is incredible they're so supportive of each other and i love it oh it is is beautiful it's and the young girls coming out and being like empowered by she's a senator she's young she's a queen i can be whoever i want yeah. it doesn't matter my girl with that thing so for sure 
someone said here that uh, Salvador said that uh, in the movie he loved how he could see Padme's dress plugged into the wall. Oh yeah, you can see the cord. You can see the cord <laughs> coming out of her dress. And, yeah, it's and, it's a classic. Because <laughs> Natalie, that's how that's how cosplayers knew it was a car battery. Because oh. Natalie Portman had a car battery in that scene, mm -hmm. um, and it must have been in an interview or something like that. So when people were putting when people were building that dress for themselves, they were like, "Oh, let's use a, let's use a car battery," except they had to carry it around with them. And which is your favorite dress? Oh my goodness! From Phantom it changes Menace. all the time. Let's go, let's go for Phantom Menace because if you go to the it's so okay, easy. Phantom Menace. Okay, that makes it a little bit easier. <laughs> so my uh, my favorite Phantom Menace dress is the uh, Senate address gown, the red one with the long headpiece. Do you know what? Um, cool. At the print. <gasps> That's fantastic. I uh, I love that dress. It's beautiful and it is so complicated <laughs> um i have a couple i have a couple friends who are making it right now and it's it's next level i love that dress so much and it's heavy it's heavy yeah, yeah. that piece is quite heavy so you can't be much <laughs> <laughs> smile and wave <laughs> so for me visually that one it's incredible but if i would have to wear I would go for the parade one. Yes, I love that one too. And the white and and talking about the premiere, I have a funny story to share with you. Because in the uh, we had the premiere for uh, the film crew, cast, and family, which happened, I think, was on Sunday, and we all went. And then there was another premiere, which would be uh, that happened. That was like all the big stars and. Um, uh, that was in the evening, yeah? And they contacted me to to ask if I would wear that outfit and to come to greet the crowd. The crowd. And um, so I said, yes, uh, but I want to go to the party too. And they're like, oh, <laughs> a party? Oh, I'm, we're not sure, and da-da-da. So I'm speaking to Hugh, yeah? And uh, he's like, okay, Christina, I'm going to talk to them and see if we can get to the party. <laughs> <laughs> seems like, seems like fair. I know. <laughs> and, and my partner in the party. And uh, because the handmaidens weren't invited to the party. I don't know why. Maybe <laughs> young, too young. The handmaidens were too young. <laughs> well, at least her night he was 12. Uh, and then, so this is, look, the Padme and her, her handmade us how close they were yeah so we are in the party but in the party there is two sections there is uh the area like when it started we had a big curtain and we could just hear the music and suddenly the curtain went up and is a whole orchestra there it was incredible Ooh. and then so there was a part on the top that was vip and the part underneath everyone is having fun as well fantastic but what happened is in the part on the top, so Natalie is there, yeah? Without any of her handmaidens, because the handmaidens weren't invited, but it's me there that managed to get in there somehow. And then she sees <laughs> me and she's like, Christina, come up, come up. And then I look at her and she's got something around her neck. And I said, I can't because you need this. So she takes off <laughs> her neck and throw it down to me which I have here to show you. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's fantastic. And she froze down in a catch. And then I'm there with my boyfriend at the time. And I was like, but I need another one. And she's like, look, pardon me, looking around, around. <laughs> she grabs one from the table and just throw it down. <laughs> That's awesome. And then, and then, with we were up and talking and then of course the other ones who because we were together all the time because me and Erita because we are next to the queen all the time so we got to be close to Liam Neeson, Ian McGregor and Hugh and I shared the car because we're both from North London so we became good friends so it was a lovely party and that's awesome yes <laughs> oh so 
funny, so funny. And she was lovely, like, and she lived near where I was living as well. And one day we had the day off. She said, Christina, shall we go to picnic in Primrose Hill? And I said, yeah, sure. So we were there sitting on the grass, having picnic. Every, uh, every time I talk to someone about, about the Phantom Menace, after like the 35 minute mark or so, it's always like, and then Natalie Portman was awesome. And <laughs> everyone always talks about how great she was. She, she's like a sunshine. He's, she's a, like a sweetheart. And her parents were around as well and really lovely too. That's so and, awesome. And I was slightly older than them uh, because at the time I think she was 16 and I was 21. <laughs> but I didn't look up. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so I became friends with her mom. We swapped Christmas cards for a few years. And uh, I want to tell you something that I read on the book that I love was like about Rabbit, that he was, that he was. It was another trick Rabbit devised. When they made it, when they made up, Amdala, they also made up the handmaidens to look as much alike as possible. So on that note, I don't want to disappoint you guys, but Amidala's best friend was Rabbi. <laughs> and I'm going to prove you guys now. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> because Tabi was... They love each other so much, and she was the decoy. She could die any moment because she was yep. in her life. But she needed someone there that could keep everything under control. No <laughs> and I only discovered that now by reading your book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that worked out. <laughs> oh. So, after how is it fans letter how is anything like that really moved you through the years i think most of my um i don't get a ton of mail because it has to uh go through my agent and stuff so it's 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 better if people just like say hi to me at a convention or or send me an email um but the 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 in-person stuff is always my favorite um and the thing that I will always remember, my, my, probably my favorite moment, the first year I was at Dragon Con, um, I'm on this panel with uh, Delilah Dawson and uh, Kevin J. Anderson, Timothy Zahn, and Michael Stackpole. So it's like the three kind of old guards and then like me and Delilah as like the, the new people. And there's like 500 people in the audience. I can't tell anybody. I've, I've lied to people about Queen's Shadow like 400 times over the course of the weekend. Like it was awful. I couldn't tell people I was writing it. So I had to be like, oh yeah, it would be really nice to write another Star Wars book. Um, but at the very end, we were doing the question and answer. And there was this little girl uh, in a Hermione costume. And she was you could see the moderator trying to like get her forward, get her forward, like trying to get the grownups out of her way. So this kid could ask her questions. The moderator tried everything. We ran five minutes over. Like it was, and we could not get to this girl. And so Delilah leans forward and is like, I'm sorry, is there any way that uh, the, the Hermione can ask her question? And the, the room, they're literally shoving people out of the room at this point. And cause Dragon Con runs on a real tight schedule. And uh, the Hermione came up to the table and like came right up to us and was like, are any of you writing forces of destiny? And when can I have more? And I was like, <laughs> this tiny child was going to ask Timothy Zahn about a YouTube, ch about a YouTube channel for girls who like Star Wars in a room full of 500 adults. Like that's the kind of Star Wars that we have right now that children feel super comfortable in and they're super excited to meet us, even if they don't really understand what we do. And I'll just remember that girl. Like she was, like she was, I've met her a couple times since then. We keep in touch. She was eight at the time and she was going to get up in front of 500 fanboys and ask 
like, and asked that question. And I'm like, I don't know if I would have been that brave when I was eight years old. Like, that was amazing. And I was like, I, and that's my favorite interaction with a fan is that she, she just loves Star Wars so much. She wanted to ask that question. And I, I love, I love it. Oh. And someone here asked a question about, um, comics sequence if they get double check something like oh that. yeah um so um, when you write a yeah when you write a star wars book or a star wars video game or a star wars comic book or a star wars movie um you work with the story group and they kind of go through and in addition to your editor so i have like my book editor who is a professional editor of books and then I have the story group and they, they, they track all that stuff. So sometimes when I'm writing, if I'm feeling particularly lazy and I don't want to look something up for myself, I'll just be like, Padme looked across the room and saw, and then in brackets, Pablo, I need an alien with six arms. And like <laughs> Pablo will just put it in afterwards for me because I don't know what it's called. Um, but that's how we keep everything straight. I'm glad you mentioned comics though. Did you know that uh, the Handmaidens are in the Vader comic? Well, Yes, because I I got interviewed, I think, two weeks ago, and she, Gemma, she opened the book and she showed me and she told, yeah. look at this. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know it was coming. And uh, so I woke up one morning on like new comic book day, and I had like 40 billion messages on Twitter that were like, oh my God, have you seen the new Darth Vader comic? And I was like, no. And then they were like, maybe you should get the new Darth Vader comic. comic. <laughs> so I got it. So I got it. And I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> yes, I need to get them now too. And Greg Pack. it's very good. Greg Pack. Yeah. yeah. He did such a good job. I, uh, he re exchanged numbers after that so I could yell at him while I was reading. <laughs> <laughs> I was having um, but it was yeah it was amazing he did a fantastic job there's always like a little bit of worry when you've spent like I'm sure other people feel it when I put out a Star Wars book that they're like oh no what if this isn't what I envisioned um, and then with with Padme or with the with the Vader book with the Vader comic book I was just kind of like oh no and then I got like three panels in and I was like everything's gonna be fine <laughs> it was beautiful oh and Isabel was saying they were so determined to confront Veda. It was amazing. Oh, yeah. No yeah, spoilers, guys. I haven't no spoilers. <laughs> it, is, it is the Darth Vader comic book. But, uh, yeah, the, the handmaidens are involved. It is fabulous. They're confronting Veda. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, so I have, yeah, that's the ones that I'm going to read next. And yeah. on that note, what's your favorite Star Wars book? So my favorite <laughs> Star Wars book? <laughs> I always have the same answer. This is like the one, the one question I can answer every time. My favorite Star Wars book is a picture book by Adam Rex called Are You Scared, Darth Vader? Um, which is hilarious and brilliant and artistically amazing. Um, in terms of how he did the pictures, but uh, the he basically built models and then took pictures of the models and then drew the characters on top of the models for like the swampy background and the, the characters in pencil sketch out front. Um, so it's, the the actual art is fantastic, but the book itself it's um, do you have have you ever read the book? Um, it's another kids book. It's kind of like an American classic, but it's called The Monster at the End of This Book. It's a Sesame Street book starring Grover. No. Um, it's a bit like that one. So it's called Are You Scared Darth Vader? And it's all of these monsters trying to scare Darth Vader. And they can't because he's Darth Vader. And then at the end of the book, you find out what Vader is really afraid of. And um, it's just, it's so good and so funny. Like, so funny. I have a very distinctive giggle. Um, and so, uh, when I read this book the first time I was at a convention, I was at San Diego comic-con and the Disney booth was like around the corner from the Del Rey booth. So like the Del Rey booth faced that way and the Disney booth faced this way. So I was in the Disney booth laughing my head off at this, are you scared Darth Vader? 
And Daniel Jose Older was signing last shot in the Del Rey booth. And he got up and came around the corner and was like, what are you reading? What is so funny? <laughs> because I was laughing so hard. Like, it was so good. Uh, so the, uh, yeah, that's, that's my favorite Star Wars book. Are You Scared Darth Vader by Adam Rex. Adam Rex. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to check that. And um, I can see we are going to be running out of time soon. So I have to ask you some questions that I normally ask, which it is, okay. if you have a superpower, what would that be? <sighs> My superpower is that without exception, I can always pick the longest checkout line at any grocery store. Pick the what? The longest checkout line. Like when I get in a line, don't get behind me because you know that that line is going to take forever. Well, but what is your superpower if you have that one? Is, it's not a great superpower, but that is the superpower that I have. If I was choosing, yes. if I was choosing a superpower, um, teleportation. I miss people so much, so much. It's teleportation. You know, I've been talking about that. I've been talking mm, soon. Like my mom in Brazil, I'm like, oh, soon they are going to invent something, mom, and I can press and I can just be there and just give you a hug. And... Yeah. Yeah. I miss people so much. <laughs> great, great power. And uh, if you could travel, travel machine anywhere, past, future, where would you go? Um, so there's this um, archaeological mystery. Um, around the city of Kadesh in the Middle East, in what is now Israel. And it was the site of a battle between the Hittites and the Egyptians. Uh, it was either Ramses II or Ramses III, I, I don't remember. Huge battle, chariot warfare. It goes on for several days. And then everybody goes home, and both sides claim to have won it. So we have no idea what happened in this battle, because The Hittites have their propaganda version of what happened and the Egyptians have their propaganda version of what happened and literally nothing changed in the city. So like, we have no idea what happened. I would love to go back and just be like, finally, some answers. Who won? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not even who won, but like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, uh, oh, what's new? The new book coming out. Oh, yes. Um, I, have, I have two books on the horizon right now. So uh, in November is Queen's Hope, which is the third Padme book. Uh, but, but in one month, um, Etherbound comes out, which is my next uh, book that's not Star Wars. And it's, it's, it is a space opera. So it's like a space adventure rebellion. Um, it's not like as... I would say it's not quite as alien as Star Wars is. Like, everybody's, everybody's human. Um, but it's, it's definitely got, because, you know, Star Wars is embedded in my DNA. It's basically, it's got some, some Star Wars elements to it. But Queen's Hope, I'm super excited for. I'm actually working on it. It is right beside me, just out of camera, like right here. Can you not just... Right here. <laughs> well, it's a, of, it's, a of, it's a lot of loose leaf paper right now. So it would probably just go... <laughs> And then I have to put them back in order. Um, but yeah, well, I'll show you the... That's the first page. Exciting. And uh, I want to read this quote, which says, All these stories illustrate courage has a ripple effect. Every time we choose courage, we make everyone around us a little better and the world a little braver. And our world could stand to be a little kinder and braver. Brené Brown, which I love. And I think this is perfect for what you do. Make 100%. Kinder, braver and empowering and it's beautiful. Kate and it's contagious. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being part of the magic of human beings and lovely to meet thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Oh, my parents just signed it. Thank you so much for reaching out to me about the book. Um, 
that was like my heart sped up. I was so excited. I was like, I went back to my friends and I was like, you will never guess who just messaged me on Instagram. <laughs> um, and that was like, it was amazing. So this has been like, this has been absolutely incredible. Oh, for me, Sophie has for me too. Do you have any questions or anything you want to say? Um, no, I think that's it for me. Great. And you have fun girl tonight. Yes, I have. Fan oh, yeah, I have fan girl Friday tonight. Uh, I'm going to be talking with my editor, Andrew Carr, uh, about Star Wars because he used to be like, oh, Star Wars. I'm a hipster. I don't like the Star Wars. Uh, but then his children became 10 year olds. <laughs> and they made him watch they made they made him watch rebels and now he like he texted me like within three minutes of every episode of rebels like oh my god did you see someone rebels this week like, blah, blah, blah. yeah so he's like a super fan now it's really funny <laughs> oh wow and you so that's tonight we're gonna talk about yeah we're gonna be on instagram at eight o'clock eastern uh talking about star wars rebels <laughs> fantastic kate is being a pleasure I salute you. Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. May the force be with you. It's <laughs> a good sign off. Someone should write that down. <laughs> <laughs> It's been wonderful. Pleasure. Likewise. <laughs>